So we know it's a large market, right? We know what, that we're going to another level of an epidemic, potentially um, larger market. But there are also a lot of drugs that are currently on the market, right? SSRIs for depression. In each of these categories, there are drugs on the market, right? So why is there an unmet need? And Jeff, maybe if you can speak to that a little bit, why does this class represent um, a medical breakthrough that, that doesn't exist in the, in the current, current classes? Yes, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to understand if you don't understand the way that the brain is organized. So I'm gonna take just a quick, uh, kind of quick primer on, on kind of the organization of the psyche at some level. Huge generalizations, I would get killed at a science conference, but these, these generalizations actually do hold water. It's, it's, it, uh, and it's particularly useful for understanding how these work. Uh, when we talk about thinking, uh, a lot, of basically what we mean is exchange of information between a set of cells called pyramidal cells. It's basically the exchange of information back and forth. There's a lot of tracks, we call them, that can flavor how we think and the speed with which we think and whether there's emotional content connecting between areas as we think. But the thinking itself is really at some level the exchange of information across these pyramidal cells. The pyramidal cells are, are deeply controlled by a net of neurons called the GABAergic inner neuron net. It's essentially inhibitory, and it stereotypes and controls what pyramidal cells are allowed to think and interact. It, it, it basically controls the patterning. Um, one of the things that humans are exquisitely good at is changing the patterning of how they think based on their experience. And so when you have an event where you literally think you're going to die, or you are uh, you know, abused as a child, and you feel unsafe in those very, very important years, the patterning becomes kind of stereotyped and rigid and constrictive. And people will fall into these spaces where, it, where almost literally you might think of it as constricted scope of consciousness, that actually they, they feel small. They feel small in the sense that they will often have the same set of thoughts over and over and over again. Um, it actually can be quite a, kind of terrifying how small people get. We have versions of, uh, of psych psychotic depression where uh, people are, uh, you know, they literally get to the point where they can't move anymore. Um, so the, the stereotypy, the constrictedness, you can think of the stereotypes as kind of a rigidity uh, in thinking. Breaking those patterns is very difficult with the standard medications that we have. They can do it a little bit, but we don't have anything near uh, the kind of power, the effect size that we have with psychedelics. What happens with the psychedelics is that they attach to that pyramidal cell that again is, is controlled by this GABAergic inner neuron net, and it causes them to be more likely to fire. It's kind of that simple. What that allows them to do is to overwhelm that inhibitory tone that inhibitory tone that, that stereotypes the thinking. And what it does, we know this very clearly, the science is amazing on this in imaging. The fMRI studies are showing very clearly that, that these particular interactions, we call it the default mode network, there's the executive network, there's a salience network. You can think of this as who I am, what I do, and what's important to me. These all interact in very specific ways in your everyday consciousness the psychedelics basically can disrupt those networks and cause that inhibitory tone, that inhibitory net of control to give up the game and learn new ways of seeing the world. And that's why we see the healing. It's, it's, it's a bit, you know, you know I, I kind of went off a bit, but I think if you understand that, you can understand why this is such a key treatment for human beings. It's been a long, long time coming. Uh, they're here now, we feel very, uh, most of us who are old guard and have been in this for 20 years, we feel very uh, excited. We're also being very careful to try to do this right because it's extremely important. So Jeff, sort of just to compare that to the existing market, right, mm -hmm. in, in simple terms. Yeah. So as we look at the pharmacology market or mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, it's strictly a chemistry kind of reaction. But we, if we look at the brain or the human being, we're a multi-dimensional mm -hmm. being, right? So. It, we tend to put things in the psychiatry market or psychology market mm -hmm. or pharmacology market, right? But the brain is much more complex than that. So one of the things that I found interesting in this is sort of the emergence of your unconscious with your conscious, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's m this moment of clarity where your unconscious can actually decipher and you can leverage your body's own intelligence to figure out what's fundamentally causing that distress. And also we tend to put 
you know, things into boxes as human beings, right? We put anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder into different categories as an investor market and even as an FDA indication, right? But our body's mechanism could uh, converge all of those things. You could be depressed and anxious. So what's interesting about this market, even though we will study it from an indication by indication basis, our bodies are able I'm able to be unleashed to sort of find some of those things. So, Saad, do you want to yeah, no, talk you about know, that? Carl Jung has a quote, which is, Un until you make the unconscious conscious, you will repeat the same mistakes over and over again, and you'll call it fake. So it's important to make what's unconscious and be conscious of it. But, but, but what I just wanted to follow up with what Jeff said, it's important to know this one little aspect of history. Um, John Cate discovered lithium to be applied for mental health purposes in 1949 in Australia. It came to the U.S. in 1950. At that time, if you had a serious mental health ailment, you were institutionalized, you were hospitalized. When lithium came onto the scene, hospital beds were freed up by 70%. Just think about that. 70% of hospital beds now freed up lithium. So you thought that you found the holy grail for mental health. We don't need to innovate here anymore. We've got the answer. Let's focus on, you know, getting man to the moon and doing other things. There's been very little innovation as a result. Prozac, which came out in the mid 80s, is literally a slight design improvement to lithium. That's it. And everything else from that point on was a slight design improvement to Prozac and you understand where this is going, right? So again, there has been a lack of innovation, but that innovation caught up from 1995 onwards when all these researchers and scientists that have been working with psychedelic medicine, really funded a great deal by the likes of Stan Groff and his work and others in the area, they got together in Esalen and they started to share notes and they realized, holy cow, you've got this anecdotal evidence, you've got that, this is pretty profound. We can get funding on the back of this at the various institutions, the academic institutions, and that's what really spurred the growth. And we are now here today with a lot more research behind it and actual solutions to lithium-backed and glutamate-based um, uh, SSRIs that are, that are going to be game-changing. And we've already seen it be game-changing. 